This next speaker I'm very excited about to, to hear that we have a, a journalist, a writer, and a futurist that is going to be giving a talk today. I think uh, journalism is, is an amazing aspect of how we get information about some of these amazing things that occur, whether it be breakthrough technology, um, <laughs> uh, the medical industry that's, you know, that they don't uh, pay someone to actually uh, uh, write an article that's, you know, for big pharma, but actually you have true investigative journalism. So um, for this field to have a journalist who is going to share some of their insights with us, I know that I'm personally very excited about. <clears throat> and this individual, has been working both freelance and has done um, work for a magazine. He's also a public speaker. Um, he spent 15 years for a Swedish technology magazine called Nye Technik. Yeah, that's... <laughs> um, also managing editor for Next Magazine. <clears throat> He's also... Uh, participated in the Innovation Journalism Program at Stanford University in the United States, and also a research analyst at Stockholm School of Economics. So I'd, I'd say, uh, Matt, you're a pretty well-rounded individual to be sharing this with us. And one more thing, also author of the book, An Impossible Invention, The True Story of the Energy Source That Could Change the World. <clears throat> And probably most interesting as well about Matt's is that he's very passionate about technology and how it influences culture and people. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Matt's to you today. Thank you, Susan. Oh, that's a strong sound. You can hear me, right? So I'm really happy to be here. It's really a pleasure. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm going to tell you a story today that some people find exciting. Some uh, uh, have great doubts and uh, find it hard to believe, and some think it's fraud. Um, so I've been to this story, which started actually with an email that I got uh, in 2011 in January. and. Shortly, I'm going to start to tell you that story. But as uh, Susan told you, my background is that I was trained as an engineer in engineering physics, and I've been working ma mainly as a technology journalist for many years. Now, I'm working on my own with this kind of activities, looking at technology influencing society and businesses, particularly digitalization, that kind of stuff. And I rarely speak about this topic, because it's so controversial that people actually don't want to hear about it. But you don't want to hear about it, so that's what I'm here to tell it. So I'm going to start um, at another point. If you look at this uh, vehicle, uh, it's, uh, it's an, uh, an autonomous car, um, so it doesn't have to ride very quick because, you know, you're not losing any time. Cars are fast only because you're losing time, because you need to sit there and drive them. But if you don't need to drive them, there is no time to lose. You can drive slowly and carefully. Uh, so it's a living room, and it doesn't have to be that robust either because it doesn't uh, get involved in accidents because it's very secure. And it runs like 10 years on one charge. Now, this car doesn't exist, of course. Not yet. It was actually designed in 2009, early designed from this kind of car, by a design studio in San Francisco. On the other hand, this truck does exist. Have you seen it? No. no. This is a truck without a truck cabin, as you can see. It's autonomous at the level four or five, which means that it can handle most situations autonomously. When it can handle the situation autonomously, it will be remote control from a control room, like a flight controller, with a driver controlling like six, six to eight trucks uh, simultaneously. Uh, it's a Swedish startup company. It's already in commercial use by Schenker, the logistic company. Only a few hundred meters, driving very slowly, but it is a commercial uh, use, commercial um, agreement between these two companies. Uh, it's electrical. It's got a battery that um, lets it run like 200 kilometers on one charge, which is not very far. Now, the difficulty of bringing electricity to trucks is that if you would need like a thousand kilometers, which would be normal for a great truck, you would need a battery of five tons, approximately, which would take too much load from the load capacity. If you have a smaller battery, you need to charge it more often. But that's not a problem if you don't have a driver to take it into account. 
you can charge it whenever you want. You can plan your transportation for charging, and you can run at any time of the, of the 24 hours. So actually, uh, um, the plan is to have this, these kind of trucks running everywhere uh, in Sweden and also in Europe uh, from city to city 24-7. Um, and charge when they need to be charging. And in that way, provide um, sustainable transportation without carbon dioxide. It's a lovely company. I'm very proud of having them in Sweden. But suppose that we could have an energy source in this truck that would make it possible for it to run one year instead of uh, one day. One year on one charge. What would that be? Would that be good? I mean, why would we even want to do that if we see that we could maybe solve the, the climate issue uh, with carbon dioxide, et cetera, with wind and solar. If we really, really, really build a lot of solar capacity and wind capacity and lots of um, storage, and we also try to slow down the pace of the world, maybe we wouldn't need those fantastic energy solutions. But, okay, so let me look at it from this perspective. I don't have any picture here. Can someone help me to have that? That would be good. Um, so let, let, let's look at it from this perspective. Let's say it like this. This is a diagram. And my message here is that those who think that we can slow down development will be disappointed. This is the ex exponential pace of change uh, since the beginning of life. On the y-axis, you can see the number of big events in 100 years. Uh, it's a logarithmic scale. On the x-axis, you can see the time before present. So, <clears throat> as you can see, it starts off here, three and a half billion years ago, very slowly, with um, a, a kind of bacteria-like uh, organisms without the cell nucleus, monocellular organisms. It takes life two billion years to develop multicellular organisms, by trial and error. Two billion years. It's hard to conceive. I would call it a slow starter, even. <laughs> and then you can see an acceleration with the Cambrian explosion. You can see we're having um, reptiles, mammals, apes walking in two legs, stone tools. We invent the fire, talking about energy, one million years ago, we think. Uh, the Homo sapiens, you know, um, moving into cities or villages 10,000 years ago so we can exchange ideas more efficiently and then we went the wheel 5,000 years ago in the written language. The spoken language was invented before 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, which is our most important invention. Because the spoken language lets us communicate and exchange ideas in a much more efficient way instead of just standing there in a circle, you know, say, ooh, 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 uh, picking berries and roots, I don't know what we did at that time. But spoken language is still the most important tool we have. So that's why it's so important to see that computers are starting to talk today. We move into villages 10,000 years ago, the wheel 5,000 years ago, the printing press and the scientific revolution 500 years ago, the, pr the steam engine and the, the um, industrial revolution 250 years ago, electricity, telephone, and radio 150 years ago, the PC and the internet 50 years ago, and the smartphone 12 years ago. So you see this acceleration. And of course, well, I claim this is just one system, biology, biology, technology. Because if you think about it, it's all self-organized. It started off with atoms, molecules, building life that eventually managed to build intelligence. And from intelligence, uh, we got technology. And there is no one there pulling strings. I mean, if you believe in a God pulling strings, you can think that, but I think most people being religious don't think of a God pulling strings, actually. So it's all self-organized. It's just one system. And it keeps accelerating. It has never slowed down, not even when the dinosaurs died 65 million years ago because the meteor hit the Earth, not of all the crises and wars and things that humanity has been through. And the simple reason is, that any invention or change, which always occurs in the universe, any change or invention that is favorable, is fed back into the system and increases the speed of change and of new innovations. So it's a feedback loop. And if you put it into maths, what comes out is an exponential um, curve. So 
And you can also observe yourself. When you wake up in the morning, it's absolutely impossible to stop thinking, stop solving problems. We just can't let go. It's impossible. So now when we have billions of people on the earth being connected through the internet, being able to exchange ideas in a way that we never were before, not like just a village with, with a few hundred people 10,000 years ago, but the whole earth, the speed of change will increase and there's nothing we can do about that. We can shape it. We can discuss it. We can see in what way we want to de de develop and see the world move. But we will never be able to slow down. So this is what we got to face. So in that perspective, let's see what happens. I mean, we understand by now that at this speed, we have to take care of our planet because uh, material resources are not endless. That's the obvious reason for the circular economy. We have to make matter, material resources, circulate. Um, but in the end, most problems that we have are solvable. Es essentially, whatever you want to do, what you need is matter, information. Yeah, it came there. <laughs> we got an energy, right. So matter, we got lots of matter. That's not a problem. Information is what we've been seeing grow exponentially through the um, IT revolution in the last decades. So we got enormous amounts of information and it's just growing. So the issue is energy. We don't have sustainable energy. If we could have also energy, we would be able to solve almost any kind of problem on, the, on Earth. That's why it's so crucially important to get new clean energy sources, in my perspective. So, <clears throat> Right. This is the situation, right? We saw it in the last talk as well. This is world energy consumption. And there are lots of fossils there. And there are several reasons to stop using fossils. Um, the climate issue is one, but even if you don't believe in uh, the climate being changed by humanly produced carbon dioxide, you can just look at the health problems of burning fossils, which I think actually is a more severe, uh, urgent problem. I'm going to come to that. We can, it's been demonstrated that it's feasible to uh, change all the fossils with wind and solar uh, by 2040 maybe. It will require huge work and huge amounts of storage, which will be also a significant um, challenge to be able to recycle all that storage materials. Battery storage is still too expensive, but it's falling, battery prices are falling by 20% a year. Um, so there is good hope for good, efficient uh, storage, battery storage, but it will be a challenge to recycle all that large amount of storage batteries all over the world. So I don't know if I have this slide here. Let's see. Um, let's then look at the energy, energy sources that we have. Essentially, there are only two of them. They are chemical and they are nuclear. So chemical reactions, if we look at energy reactions, um, exother exotherm reactions. Chemical reactions are when electrons are moving from one atom to another. Nuclear reactions are when we have changes in the atomic nucleus. And that's essentially what we have. Chemical reactions is burning things on, on, on Earth. A chemical and, and the nuclear reactions that we know of uh, that are efficient today are efficient, dividing large on nuclei in our uh, um, power plants. And we got the fusion reaction, plasma fusion in the reaction. That is hypothesized to be the one that powers uh, the stars and the sun. And essentially, if you look at wind and solar, that's um, originally from solar power, which is nuclear originally. Also, if you would like to say that, you could see that fossils is also nuclear originally because uh, Fossils is biological material originally, and that's been built by solar energy. So, But let's say that that's chemical. To make it more understandable why nuclear um, reactions are so much more powerful, you could compare an electron with a housefly, which weighs like 20 milligrams, circling around the atomic nucleus. And in that case, if you take an element like iron, for example, normal iron with 56 nucleons, the, the uh, nucleus would weigh two kilos. So it's a huge difference. That gives you an intuitive idea why 
chemical reactions are so much weaker than nuclear reactions. If, uh, effectively, um, for every atom, a nuclear reaction releases a million times more energy, roughly, than a chemical reaction. A million times. Which is the reason why one gram of nuclear fuel corresponds to one ton of a chemical fuel, like oil, for example. So it's extremely compact. It's very favorable. Now, the two ways of doing nuclear reactions, we can look at this scheme here of so-called binding energy, which explains why nuclear reactions work as far as we know today. In all reactions, even chemical or nuclear, what is happening is that you convert mass into energy. Now, as you know, the Einstein's famous formula, energy equals mass times speed of light squared which means that you need very tiny amounts of mass to get large amounts of, of energy. Actually, one gram of matter, matter will turn into 25 gigawatt hours of energy, if you can convert it completely. When you think about burning uh, chemical reactions, you don't think about it as losing mass, but actually you lose a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of mass in the chemical reaction, if you take into account all the products at the start and at the end. And it's considered to be binding energy. That's something that's pulled together or put together the electrons in the places they were before. And that binding energy has some mass, which is being converted into energy. Now, in nuclear reactions, we have the same situation. And it happens to be that the binding energy per nucleon in the atom nucleus um, is largest. Um, well, this depends. This curve happens to sometimes you picked it in the other way around, upside down. Now, I, I prefer to have it this way around. So uh, you, could, you could consider it this way. Atoms are more relaxed when they are like iron in the middle. They kind of oof, sit there, and the nucleus is very bound very tightly together, which means that going towards iron, it releases energy to get there. And to go from iron to either small nuclei or to, to large nuclei, you have to provide energy, right? So that's why if you take a large nucleus like uranium and you split it into two, it's going to release energy, lots of energy, a million times more than chemical reactions, and it goes towards iron. And that's also the reason why you can fuse small nuclei like um, deuterium, uh, heavy hydrogen in the sun, to helium, and you will get lots of energy because it, it, it's more relaxed in the, in the format of helium <coughs> compared to, to deuterium. So this is essentially why we get energy out of nuclear reactions and chemical reactions. So let's go back. So you understand that, well, nuclear reactions seems to me be much better. The problem, the issue is that if you look at fission power that we have, you need radioactive fuel. You have lots of radiation du during the reaction. You've got radioactive waste. Now everyone talks about fusion, which would be holy grail because you could use hydrogen from the water to, uh, as a fuel, which is not radioactive, but during the reaction, fusion reaction, you got huge amounts of neutron radiation. It's so much that you don't even know if the, if the material around the reactor will, will resist for, for such a long time as you believe. Then you got radioactive, not waste, but you got kind of the building material from the reactor will be reactivated afterwards. And radioactivity is not very nice. We don't want that. So, but still, we're working on that. You've heard about ITER, I suppose, the massive scale um, fusion project reactor that's being built in the south of France uh, that is supposed by 2027 to be able to run for eight minutes and produce 500 megawatts of uh, energy with an input of 50 megawatts, so a COP of 10. Maybe it's costing 15 billion euros, at least, probably more, 20, 25. And then maybe in 2033, we're going to have the demo reactor, which is a continuously running a reactor of that kind, but only a demo. And then maybe beyond 2050, we're going to have a proto-reactor, which would be the first commercially viable reactor of the fusion. And some, sometimes people say, well, we're going to have that maybe already 10 years from now. But Yet we got this huge amount of radiation that we don't want. So here comes low energy nuclear reactions. This is where the story starts. And first time 
uh, they, uh, actually, they've been investigated before um, in, at the beginning of the 20th century, but the first time it really got well known was when these two gentlemen, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann, presented their uh, experimental results in 1989 at the University of Utah in March. So what they did was they had this little tiny uh, jar here, which is an uh, electrolysis cell where they uh, split water molecules, heavy water, that is water with oxygen and deuterium, at least one deuterium, maybe two. Um, and they had two electrodes. Uh, the electrode, the, the, the cathode was um, a palladium. And palladium has a capacity of absorbing hydrogen or deuterium into it. And what they did was they were just pulling electricity into the cell. It bubbled, it bubbled, it bubbled. And after a couple of days or weeks, the temperature started to rise more than could be explained by the chemical reactions. You know, we had this separation between chemical reactions and nuclear reactions, and nuclear reactions release a million times more energy than chemical reactions. And they could see that the amount of energy that came out of the cell suddenly was much more than could be explained by any known chemical reaction. So, in that case, it has to be nuclear. But what kind of nuclear reaction? Well, the hypothesis was that the deuterium uh, atoms bubbling up their molecules split into atoms, they were absorbed into the, the, the structure of the palladium and came so close that the uh, probability of having a fusion would increase so much that it would happen, actually happen. Because the problem with fusion is that you got nuclei that are both positively charged and you need to fuse them together, but they are repelled because they are both positive. And the well-known thing of doing that, that they try to do in ITER, is to raise the temperature to 100 million degrees. 100 million degrees. You, you can't have that plasma touching the walls because it would burn anything. So what happened, according to Fleischmann and Pons, was that those nuclei got so close inside the palladium structure that they actually could fuse without that high temperature because the probability of them fusing was much greater. <coughs> That's what was their hypothesis. And from there came the expression cold fusion, because it's not 100 million degrees, it was just uh, 1,000 degrees maybe, or a few hundred degrees. And great excitement in the uh, academia, great excitement in media, but after just a few months, it was considered to be a, uh, a totally disaster. Because people started to try to replicate this experiment, and they didn't manage. Uh, why didn't they manage? Well. You could say um, they thought that they didn't match because it was impossible. It didn't work. It actually didn't. They thought that they didn't work even for Fleischmann pawns. But if you think about it, you know, experimental things that you've been doing for 10 years or something are probably very hard to do. And it's not easy for someone else to replicate it in just a few weeks. Another thing that must be noted here is that the people who tried to replicate had an, 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 a conflict of interest. At one of those institutions, they were actually working with the plasma fusion, being provided with lots of funding for researching plasma fusion as a source of, en source of energy. And the day that you would see such a reaction work, you would stop all funding for plasma fusion because it's much too expensive and cumbersome. So what happened was that at a meeting at the American Physical Society, just a few months after this, no, uh, this um, piece of news, uh, at a meeting there, where the flashman pumps were not even present they ridiculed them and said that this is probably a pathological science. They, they wanted to find something but was, that was not there, and they interpreted the measurements and the, and the numbers as a, re, a positive result where there was nothing to see. And after that, cold fusion has been non-touchable, a career killer. No one could touch it, essentially. Only a few hundred researchers, 100, 200, have been continuing doing this research since then. And after a while, fairly, sh fairly, um, a few, few, after a while, they, this, they changed the name for from cold fusion to low energy nuclear reactions because it was not obvious that it was actually a clean um, fusion reaction between high, uh, uh, deuterium providing helium. No one really knew what kind of reaction it was. It seemed to be nuclear. The other problem was that they actually managed to replicate. They managed to replicate, and, and they managed so well that they understood some necessary requirements. And they also, with knowing these necessary requirements, they could prove why the replication attempts at the early stage were not, uh, didn't succeed. So they understood why uh, the replication couldn't be done at the early stage. 
they managed to replicate, but only occasionally. You know, very elusive, with low power output powers. And yet they couldn't stop researching because they knew that was something there. And I will give you one example to understand this. Already with Fleischmann and Pons, a few years before their presentation, they had an early version of the experiment with a small piece of palladium as an electrode, as a cathode, in, in water with lithium added. And they had been going for months with a certain uh, um, current intensity. And then one day they decided to double the current from 0 0.75 amperes to 1.5 amperes, not very much. And they left it for the weekend and they came back and found the lab bench with a big hole in it and a hole like that in the concrete floor, one foot large and like that profound. And they just couldn't explain it. Something had risen the temperature to several thousand degrees and made this thing just burn a hole in the concrete floor. And th these are the kind of experiences that these researchers found that made them, you know, just have to continue to do the research, although they just found results occasionally. So, then we start with the story that I came into. Uh, let's see. I think so. I don't remember. How. No, right. Let's see. Now let's first look at this one. So if you had th the big reason for having an, such an energy source, like, like um, low energy nuclear reactions, a very compact, radi uh, without ra radioactivity. Th that's okay. Let me see. I forgot something here. So there are a few miracles with low energy nuclear reactions. The first one is that you manage to fuse or make some kind of nuclear reaction without that high temperature. The second one is that you don't have any strong neutral ra radiation. This, um, and the third one is that you don't have any high energy gamma radiation. So that's very strange. So it's, but it's a perfect energy source. It's a nuclear, very compact energy source without radiation. So if we would have that, we would solve the climate problem. We could have an energy, energy source that could produce lots of energy for us everywhere without um, providing any, any um, exhaust gases, no carbon di dioxide. But apart from that, if you don't believe that climate is a problem, you could look at the health problem. Seven million people die every year of air pollution. Half of them by ambient air pollution, half of them by household air pollution from, from stoves and wood burning wood fires. Seven million people. That's just slightly below the most deadly disease, which are, which are heart diseases in the world. So that's a huge reason for stop burning fossils and wood. Now, we get geopolitics. It's not as far-fetched far to say that wars today are all fought for control over gas and oil, high-value commodities. It's always been that in history. Now the high-value commodities are gas and oil, and we are fighting wars for that. So what would happen if we took away that, that important power, control a few that control the energy sources for the world? Security. In all countries today, we got, as Susan pointed out, in California, we got centralized um, power grids, which are a perfect target for terrorism and cyber war. We know, if you haven't looked at it, uh, have a look in Wired magazine, for example, for the stories around what Russia is doing in Ukraine. They have been knocking out the power grid completely to, twice. And just, you know, for half a day, a day, just to show that they can do it, so the Ukrainians know that they are kind of vulnerable. You know, in front of all the operators' faces, they see the computers just shutting down, the power grid shutting down. They do that with viruses. It's extremely interesting. And that's not a good thing to have. I mean, today you, need, you, you don't need any weapons to, to take a country. You just pull out the electricity for two or three days, and then the country is weak and ready for being invaded. Um, economy, of course. If you got free energy or cheap energy, clean energy, uh, you got a kind of in, um, battery power going into the economy, making it possible, for example, for the whole transportation industry to grow sustainability uh, with, uh, in a sustainable way. And the transportation industry in itself is something that provides energy or, or the blood system for all other um, industrial and, and economic activities. Innovation with energy sources that you can transport. They, they are small, flexible, and cheap, and, and clean. 
you can innovate lots of products. And apart from that, we already got the sciences aspect of this, because it seems that understanding these kinds of reactions open up our understanding much more to new, a, a new view on matter and energy. So there is so much coming out of this, so many reasons, so many good things coming out of this kind of energy source. And there is actually already an ecosystem around low energy nuclear reactions. You got research in all these countries, US, Russia, uh, China, India, Japan, it Italy, mainly, uh, also in Sweden, by the way. But these countries have been doing the research. You got um, um, startup companies like Brilliant Energy, Nick Energy, Jet Energy, Brilliant Light Power. You got big companies like Boeing, Airbus, Mitsubishi, Toyota, Nissan, ST Microelectronics, and NASA organizations doing research and even uh, claiming patents on, on these kind of technologies. Then you got um, um, non-profit organizations like Morgan and Fleischmann Memorial Project. Bob is one of the founders sitting here. And uh, actually an also in industrial association already. So there is already an ecosystem in place. And everyone is in, in this, this little ecosystem is trying to find, to understand what it's all about. And so far, the situation is that there are observations there is no validated theory about actually what's going on. But it connects to what we heard also in the last talk here. So it's very much the same thing that's going around and being investigated. And how I came into this in 2011 was uh, meeting, uh, I got an email from a reader when I worked at my newspaper about a demonstration in Bologna made by Andrea Rosse, where he suddenly said that, well, I have this machine based on cold fusion alone do nuclear reactions. It starts every time and it produces not just a few hundred watts, but kilowatts. Oh, that's interesting. So I wrote a short piece on it and I discovered that that was a huge interest among our readers. We got 100,000 um, reads in that article that when we normally had like 5,000 engineers, which was the target group of our newspaper. They were very interested, but also very annoyed. It still was very controversial, and I got a lot of criticism for bringing this up. But eventually I understood, I need to talk to this guy. And the funny thing is that my wife is Italian, he's Italian, so I got the language possibility, talking to him directly. And he actually got some kind of confidence in me. Um, so we started a, a kind of a relationship, professional relationship of having a dialogue. And I went down to see him. I went down with my instruments and I measured four times on his early device. This device was a kind of a copper tube. Inside you had some kind of reactor. It was very closed. You couldn't see inside. Inside the reactor you had nickel powder, he said, and hydrogen gas, and later it turned out also aluminium and lithium. So basic elements abundant on Earth. He started heating it and had water passing through, and he boiled water to measure how much energy it produced. So you got input power and output power, and the output power was like twice as much as the input power. Two times, twice, three times. And I measured this a few times myself. Obviously, there, is always, there are always discussions on errors and measurements, specifically regarding the input power, which was electrical. So you can cheat with waveforms and other stuff like that. Um, but Essentially, what I saw was an energy gain. So I started to co involve other people. I, I, I talked to a professor in Sweden called Sven Kullander. He was uh, part of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and also in the Nobel, Nobel Committee for the Physics Nobel Prize. Um, I asked him about it. What do you think about this? I also invited uh, another uh, professor in ther theoretical physics called uh, Hanno Essen, who was the chairman for the Skeptic Society in Sweden at that time. And I invited them for a discussion. And uh, it, to my surprise, they said that this is very interesting. Well, that's nice. But I didn't expect that from the scientific community. But apparently, I had picked two persons that were really open-minded. They went down to Andrea. They made their measurement. Uh, no, they made their observations on his measurement. And came back and wrote a report and stated, this is a nuclear reaction. And you can understand the discussion that came out of that in the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. They really didn't like what they saw. I must say, I'm very sad to tell you that Sven Kilander passed away a few years ago, and I know that when they, the Academy of Sciences should write his, um, what do you say, ob ob obituary. obituary, right. Someone wanted to put in these things about cold fusion to, to criticize him after he was dead. So sad. Yet, some people are still continuing in the research area in Sweden. I involved other scientists 
And uh, we got heavily criticized by the National Radio, Ra Swedish Radio, for example, later on. So what happened? He had some connections. He wanted to build a, a larger reactor. He had connections with a Greek company, a startup company, that he later broke with. He had some difficulties in, in, in connecting with the industrial side to make something more product and product size out of this. But he decided that he wanted to build, uh, anyway, uh, uh, a reactor producing one megawatt of heat, which is like, you know, uh, a few hundred electrical stoves at full power. Eventually he did that in October, the same year. And that was a funny situation. Um, he ran around, uh, we were like uh, 50 people observing there. Uh, we got close to the, the container a few times. Inside there he had like 60 reactors producing together lots of heat boiling water, producing steam. And uh, I understood afterwards that he had great difficulties in keeping it stable. Uh, it was leaking and it was running away in difficulties. And as somebody pointed out, if this is a fraudster, because many people thought I was a fraudster, if this is a fraudster, this is a really silly way to make a fraud. To build a big thing like that, put money into it and even make it look bad. <laughs> Because the background of Rossi was that he started as an inventor in the 70s working with electrical, electrostatical filters for removing dust from uh, smoke uh, in industries. Then he went over to, he had this idea of turning organic waste into oil, what today is called biofuel. At the time it was highly controversial. And in Italy he, had, he got three enemies. He got the oil industry, he got the organized crime that wanted to hand the fuel, uh, the, the waste, and he got the, the cities that wanted to hand the, handle the waste. And they were after him. And eventually he ended up in prison, not for fraud, but for uh, bookkeeping errors, because his company couldn't be handled while he was in prison. And the man that was chasing him was the financial police uh, who came from Caserta, which is the region where the criminal uh, organized crime is, has its roots in Italy, and they handled at that, that lot time lots of illegal waste. Now, this uh, person, the financial, he ended, ended up as the second top boss of the financial police in Italy until he got arrested a few years ago for criminal, um, for, um, well, he had taken money to help, um, it was a project around Venezia where they tried to stop the flood water to come in, EU product, lots of money, and he put that money in his pocket. Essentially, he was, he was a fraudster. So when people say that he's a fraudster, they, hadn't, they haven't looked into this story. That was this Swedish journalist going after me and, and proving with documents that he's been in prison, that this is a fraudster. But I must say that he didn't realize what could happen in Italy if you, at this 80s, tried to make biofuel from organic waste. So y you see, again, the discussion has always, always been around this person. He's, he's a fraudster. There are measurement errors. And yet he continued. And what I saw that he had great difficulties in finding an industrial collaboration somewhere that could help him going from being an inventor to making an industrial product and take it to market. So I was so pleased when I heard that in 2012 he had um, made an agreement with an unknown company in the States that um, uh, supposedly had the rights to produce this technology all over the world and sell it, basically, in, uh, not in Europe, I think in the American and Asia. And the next step in that evolution, apart from there was a test being done by a Swedish professor in Switzerland uh, who had one other kind of reactor that he had built and they released the report and it seemed to be produce um, uh, lots of energy again. Uh, and every time this came out, every time there were lots of criticism, people saying that this is measured in the wrong way and I got personally attacked several times, uh, but also people being interested. You know, I, I was so, I mean, I was, I was really fascinated about specifically the people saying that you shouldn't be doing this. But why, I asked. We're not sure. I, I don't have any proof that it's fraud. It could be real. And if it's real, it's going to save the world. Why shouldn't I be curious? And I couldn't understand the scientific community that would say, this is impossible because cold fusion is impossible. So you shouldn't look at it. But why? Aren't you scientists? Aren't you curious? For me, science is observation. Observation is king. If you see an observation, although you can't believe it, it's an observation. Start looking at it. See if you can see it again. If it comes again, there is something to see. No matter if it seems to be impossible or not. 
It has happened before in, in history of science. So I couldn't understand, but I also understood that there were several of these critics that were actually having a, 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 a conflict of interest, being paid by someone to criticize me because they, it was in someone's interest. So being in all, in all this kind of mm, stormy situation, I tried to follow the, 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 the work of Andrea and, and keep up with seeing what he was doing. And well, I was happy to see that he finally find this industrial partner. So then he decided, let's see what the next, yeah, you're going to see this one. <laughs> so Brad Pitt is involved. You're going to find this interesting. So what happened was that uh, in the agreement he made with um, the company called Industrial Heat, he, pro he promised to make a year test. Uh, um, he would have a, a new plant producing one megawatt of heat uh, for 350 days out of 400 in Miami, Florida. So uh, in the beginning, everything seems, seems to go fine, although he had had some discussions already before with this company of starting the project or not. And they invented investors. They invented Woodford, uh, Neil Woodford, who is, uh, has got this investment, acti uh, investment activity in, in uh, UK. And Brad Pitt invested in, in Woodford's funds, and they uh, invested like $50 million into the project. And everyone seems to be, ha seemed to be happy. But at half time of the year, I started to understand that there were controversy between uh, the company, Industrial Heat, and, and Rossi. And in the end of the test, when it was terminated in February 2016, uh, I heard nothing. And I waited for the report. They had an independent uh, controller measuring everything with his closed and sealed um, instruments. And finally, the report didn't come, but Rossi uh, sued his partner for $89 million. Oh, wh wait a minute. <laughs> what happened here? So it turned out that he had this agreement with Industrial Heat uh, that he, would be, he had been paid already $11 million uh, for an initial test where they, had, in compensation, had re received the whole recipe for the technology. He would make this one-year test and receive another eight to nine million dollars. Um, but they didn't want to pay it because they started to say, this doesn't work. It ended up with a lawsuit. It was one year of investigation. And on the first day of the trial, on the second day of the trial, there was a settlement. Um, so what happened was that he didn't got his money, but he got the license back. He said, I could have got the money. Uh, but I prefer to get the license back because I was actually tied with this stupid company for my life. Uh, he had promised to give every invention to them, uh, future invention. When I looked closer at this, and, and recently I started to understand what I think happened. This reaction is so difficult to get going, and this person is so particular. Well, let me take one piece of a time here. Andrea Rossi, when he was 19 years old, he set the record, I think a European record or something, uh, I don't remember exactly, running 24 hours non-stop on a running course. 24 hours without stopping. So you kind of understand what kind of person this is. He's so r focused on what he's doing, on working, doing, achieving, arriving. Never stopping. Then he's kind of a genius, and he's got some kind of these that you might have seen in some scientists, some kind of imaginary capacity of seeing connections without actually knowing the theory behind it. And you, this is what you th I think you need in areas like cold fusion or low energy nuclear reactions, where there is no theory and you have an observation, you have to, have to find your way. So there is only trial and error and try to imagine what you can change next. So he's doing like 10 experiments a day, a thousand a year. Trying, 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 trying. And even though he gave the recipe to the industrial heat, I don't think that they ever managed to make this work because it was still so difficult to it, get it going. You had to have the brains and the fingers of Andrea Rossi there to get it going. And when he was there, it actually worked. And when I started all the proof in the lawsuit, the, the, they tried to prove that it didn't work. When you look at it as an engineer, you see that they had no proof that it didn't work. It actually worked for one year. It produced one megawatt of heat. What he was doing, meanwhile, um, he was starting to look at a new version, of course. He's an engineer. He started to look at a new version of this reactor. It was so unstable that middle-wise, during this period, he started to open the reactors while running them and looking at them inside because he wanted to understand. He wanted to see the light of this reaction, see how it moved, how the pieces of it moved. He stayed there every night. 
by, by his own, because he was afraid that there might be some kind of strange radiation or something, so he wouldn't expose anyone else to it. And he started to develop the next uh, version of this reactor. Um, he got cancer in his head and in his throat. We don't know where that came from. It might have come from those experiments. We don't know yet. There is a very low, very, very low photon radiation, non-ionizing radiation from this reaction. And so uh, if you know the difference between ionizing radiation or not, ionizing radiation is the energy of photons that are so high that they can knock out electrons from the atom. They, are, they have more energy like 10 electron volts. Here we're talking about, s in the beginning, 6 to 8 electron volts. Now Ross is going down to about between a half and 1.5 electron volts. It's like infrared light. So visible light is between 3 and 6 electron volts, right? I think. So the, the beginning was ultraviolet, now it's infrared. infrared. Um, he demonstrated this new reactor in Stockholm. He asked me to do the presentation um, in 2017. And I was there. Um, it was not very impressive. Um, the, the, it was not very accurate, the measurement either, I have to say. Um, but it was the start of something. And I still think that this, at this point, the, the reactor was it still needed him. He had some kind of electronic circuit putting pulses into the, the reaction to make it start. And it could be stable. Um, it released, apart from energy, also electricity, which made it very complicated because the electricity was fed back into the control system and producing heat there, destroying the electronics. So you had to cool that, which consumed other energy. So that was an issue with, when measuring the total amount of energy being put into it. But after that, he continued um, during a, um, a year and he developed a new version that he actually presented in January this year with this um, presentation that I have to admit not very professional made, maybe, <laughs> as a product launch for the first viable uh, low energy nuclear reactions reactor. But he actually claimed that now I have, now I have um, a reactor working. And I'm not going to sell it to you. I'm going to sell the heat. So he wanted customers buying the thermal energy from this reactor. I mean, if it doesn't work, if it's a fraud, he would just be losing money. And he claims to have like three or four or five customers in these states, but he's very careful uh, about letting more in. But he said that this is open for market. So it's essentially a commercially viable product, producing like 20 kilowatts of heat. Inside, in the plasma, there is about 1,000 degrees. He can heat water to um, steam for the Carnot cycle up to five, 600 degrees without any problem, he says. It runs a nickel, hydrogen, uh, lithium, he doesn't know for a long time the fuel lasts. He got a few grams of fuel inside. He says he can recycle the fuel. But um, he wanted to go on from there because he still have input power. So the next step was to use the electricity from the reaction to feed the electronics so that you could pull out the power plug and have it stand alone. And that's what he's doing right now. Furthermore, he's published his paper about the theory around it. It's not a complete theory because it doesn't say where the energy comes from. It's, it talks about similar things that we heard in the last talk, screening about electron clusters, screening um, with uh, something called the Casimir force, or screening with it regards to the electron not as a point, as we heard before, but as a moving circle, moving at the speed of light, creating a magnetic field that could actually um, shield the repelation between the same um, uh, the repelation between electrons. So you can have you could have clusters of electrons. Another aspect of this would be uh, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you can have particles uh, occurring and disappearing, and those particles could stand in between the electrons and also shield from the repelling force. These are different ideas about how electrons could build uh, build clusters that in turn could. Uh, lead to long-range particle interaction in the nuclear, nucleus. And it's been read like 30,000 times on the um, research gate. You can have a look at it. It's interesting, but it's not, it's not the whole theory. What I'm seeing right now, and this is the end of it, uh, coming closely now. What I see, I'm, I'm in uh, continuous dialogue with uh, Andrea. Um, well, you should also know this. Google, you might have heard about it. Google went into to repeat the kind to replicate these kind of experiments uh, in the last few years. And they, they published an article in Nature that have never touched this subject. Nature never touched the subject of, of cold fusion. 
And what they found was that they couldn't replicate anything. They tried lots of these uh, things with nickel and hydrogen. Um, they put in $10 million. They made like five, 400 experiments. And when Rossi heard that, he told me, well, 400, that's nothing. They haven't even started. You can't, they are very accurate experiments. But he said, you must, must need to do much more to find anything. My hope now, what I'm, I have a dialogue with him, He's trying, he's at, he said that in a few weeks he will be ready with his self-sustaining reactor. Um, I will encourage him to finally make a test by an independent party that he can trust. Because uh, as an inventor, the thing that he's really afraid of is losing the acknowledgement of having invented this. So he's afraid of letting anyone try it, that they will reverse engineer it and claim it that they invented it. So he's very careful. That's a personal trait of him as an inventor. I'm not surprised. But I'm trying to help him organize a test where he can trust the people. And then uh, what I would like to see also is, and I see that he's tired of this idea of industrial uh, collaborators, industrial company that would invest lots of money and try to spread it to the world. And I will try to encourage him to let this become open source to the world. Publishing the recipe, and he says today that this thing is so stable today, it doesn't need his fingers, his brains any longer. It's so stable that you can buy the stuff on the internet. If you have a sufficient level of technology, in one week you can build it and make it work for a few dollars. And I think that if we let that open source to the world, it's not so something you can do in, 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 in a blink like that. It's not got to be severely prepared with lots of lobbying, lots of PR, lots of involvement, the right spokespeople. It's not easily done. But I would like to do that. That's my aim. But I have a dialogue with Andrea, and let's see what comes out of it. I would like to end with this fabulous quote by Arthur C. Clarke. Like all revolutionary new ideas, the subject has had to pass through three stages, which may be summed up by these reactions. It's crazy. Don't waste my time. Well, it's possible, but it's not worth doing. I always said it was a good idea. Thank you. Do we have time for a few questions? Yes, okay. we do. Um, thank you. Uh, have you ever uh, wondered, like I have, uh, that uh, maybe a different type of economic system or economic thinking around inventions like these uh, would make it easier to bring them to the forefront? Um, well, that's, yeah, if I understand your question right, thank you. Um, if I understand you right, it's a little bit connected to the open source idea, right? Um, because if I, there is a writer, an American writer called Stephen Johnson, who wrote a book called Where Good Ideas Come From. And uh, apart from very interesting reasoning about how ideas come out, and he talks about the adjacent possible, if you have one idea here, you can see the next here. When you see the telephone, you can imagine cutting the cord and make a mobile telephone. But you can't just jump from the steam engine to the iPhone, it's too far. So, very interesting ideas in that way. But he also says that he make, uh, made a, a division between different kinds of, of, of inventions and how you take them to market. So on one axis you got one inventor versus lots of people to working together. On the other axis you have patent or open source. And it turns out if you look at the classical old invention like the dynamite, one inventor based on patent and you make a business out of it. But today, most inventions, if you look at it, in the last few hundred years, specifically in the last uh, hundred years, most inventions that really come to market efficiently are open source made by many people, like the internet. Because then you get the possibility to have a frame for other people to use their creativity, scientific creativity and inno innovation force around. And I think that this is the kind of invention that should be done in that way. Here's the heat source. Do whatever you want with it. So I think that's a way of taking this kind of technology to market. OK, but if I can <laughs> slightly expand on that. Uh, I mean, if these types of technologies really uh, will be able to manifest themselves, um, they are like, like the, the complete, they, they turn around the complete world economy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So do you have any suggestion or vision about what to do with all those employees of all those oil companies and 
stuff like that. Oh, yeah, right. So it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you, get, you get some time. And it will boost the economy so much once you get it going that, uh, I mean, uh, need for work will not be a problem. Because if you have an energy source providing free energy or cheap energy, clean energy in that way, you can build so much new, many new businesses. But obviously, it will be a challenge from many perspectives, both geopolitically and industrially for the oil industry. The oil industry, on the other hand, is already prepared for the attack from solar. You can see what Aramco does in Saudi Arabia. They know that this is coming, although that it was, this would be a slighter, larger challenge for them. And I th actually believe that they're monitoring the very ECA technology very closely as well. So they're ready. Okay. Oh, right sorry, here? I was over there. Yeah, right here. And then here. Oh, thank you. I was right behind you. <laughs> Fine. Hi. Um, you just mentioned the paper of Rossi and uh, studied uh, very deeply and also followed the link he is, uh, is citing. And have you ever met Professor Celani? Celani. Yes, yeah, Celani. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he, he mentioned some about the effects or the theory that Rossi is using. And when you follow the, in the links and sites in Celani, you see the, he was uh, was connected to random mills, which uh, only uh, also has uh, the same ideas and following the principles he want to use. Uh, have you also contact to these people? Yeah, I contact with Celani. I don't. Uh, I've never been in contact with random mills actually. Um, um, there are surely connections. Uh, I, I should add one thing, which could be interesting from a social point of view, is that Ross is not very well. Uh, liked by the community of low energy nuclear reactions. So the simple reason that he sucked out every information he could find, published, and he never um, released anything himself. Uh, he's not a researcher, he's an inventor, and he always tried to work in that way. Um, and also he ruined the market, because uh, when, it's, when you started talking about kilowatts instead of watts, it was very difficult for the old uh, kind of community of low energy nuclear reactions to get funding for reactions that produce much less heat that, than he was claiming to be producing. So there is a kind of a conflict in the, in the community um, from that reason. About Rundle Mills, that's a particular kind of uh, idea about the hydrina that we can talk about later. And I, I don't think they are connected. We've got time for one more. Yeah. Hold on one second. Oh. <clears throat> Um, about eight years ago, I lectured about uh, Rossi's invention. It seems uh, he's converting uh, uh, isotope of nickel to an isotope of copper, so it may be a low energy nuclear that, reaction. Yeah, that, that was the, the very, very early hypothesis from uh, uh, his scientific colleague called Sergio Focardi, who passed away too, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't, th th it was abandoned rather early. But on direct question, what Rossi says is that uh, he still believes that the energy comes from, um, from mass conversion to energy, at least. That's the only thing I understand of what he believes from the energy source. Conversion of mass into energy, at least we have that uh, kind of um, scientific proven um, relationship. Yeah. Sorry. Uh. Okay, on that last one, um, if you run the reactor for a long time, it goes beyond copper. But anyway, that's what yeah. we've seen on our test. If Alexander, uh, sorry, if Andrea Rossi is serious about an organisation and he ultimately who wants this to be open, I would suggest that the MFMP would finally be willing to test his reactor. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so please put that forward. Yeah. Uh, and I'm very excited the fact that uh, he was uh, uh, considering open sourcing it. The big risk that I see um, is that uh, the reaction tends to produce, according to the Russians, in various forms, a, a type of radiation, uh, which they have de called the string vortex soliton. Yeah. And they have uh, established that this um, carries ions with it, even through metals. And they discharge the ions, and they've characterized this very, very well in uh, uh, plastic plates with the width and the depth of the pits created, uh, showing that the energy is sufficient to destroy red blood cells and to cause damage to DNA in white cells. 
there's another point about this is that it has uh, potentially it's made of cold neutrinos and they can take the carbon 14 in your DNA strands and convert it into nitrogen 14. So you get a secondary path to DNA damage. And a lot of researchers in this field have died from cancer. Yep. And it's interesting that you're saying for the first time publicly that he suffered cancer from looking potentially yep. into his reactors. There is ways to detect this, and I would suggest that the Sapphire group look at this as well because they should have these detection methods in their labs and there are ways to protect against it that the Russians have developed and characterized. And, and so if it's going to be open sourced, we need to understand what the type of radiation that's coming out is, and uh, I would uh, implore people to consider that. Sure, obviously. Uh, security, uh, this as aspect of any kind of risk with the technology must be thoroughly investigated before eventually possibly releasing it as, as open source. Okay, very good. Oh. Thank you. I, if you Thank this you, is the Mads. book I've, I've published. Um, you can find it on Amazon. It tells the story until 2014. So it's not uh, it, uh, the last few years. You can find them on my blog uh, with the same name, impossible, and impossibleinvention.com. There are some latest developments. If you want to look further into this field, there is also a website called ECAT World, ECAT World, which is um, publishing new uh, news regularly. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you.